Are you sapping your boss for when he comes? Oh. Uh, are you yeah. sapping your boss when he comes? Uh, helping out. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to CSI? Yeah. Right away? Yeah, I was just going to check. Things up on together. Yes, I'm just going to, if you want to see the other part, please. I'm sure. Because they reach out and break it. Yeah. 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 Y
in place to help um, get ahead of this outbreak. And what I mean by that is if we think about you know, one of the most urgent things we could do, CDC has the best epidemiologists in the world. We have some of the best personnel. I know um, we've been getting conflicting reports. We've had some folks in country, but now would be a time for us to collaborate with the, the Chinese to get our best epidemiologists to the epicenter so we can actually answer some of the health questions that are there. How easily is this transmitted human to human? How um, are people infectious when they're asymptomatic? Are people um, infectious when they don't exhibit symptoms? Or is it only when they're, they're symptomatic? Um, you know, we've had conflicting reports of what the incubation period is. Times we're told it's up to 14 days, then we were told it was five to seven days, then we're told it's three to five days. All of these are incredibly important questions for us to ask, so we can not just help the Chinese um, as well as the rest of the world internationally, but we can also plan our response here. A second important point that we learned um, post Ebola and post other pandemics is the importance of having an individual or small group of individuals who can coordinate across the interagency process. To date, you know, we don't have that single individual that has sole responsibility of that coordination. We've heard that Secretary Azar, extremely capable individual, but he runs Health and Human Services, and if there is, if this broadens here locally, Health and Human Services is gonna have their hands full responding and supporting our public health efforts here. We've got a great CDC um, director, but they've got a specific role. The DOD can do logistics, and they've got a specific role. Um, Homeland Security you know, has a specific role. One of the recommendations was at the national security level, we really do need to have a single individual who can coordinate the whole interagency process. And you know, Mr. Klain, I know you, you were instrumental in that role, and you know, certainly um, look forward to, to hearing your thoughts about why that is such an import, important role. Number three, um, in the era that we live in, information but misinformation that's out there is going to be really important. As the public, you know, should this um, spread in the United States, um, what is the, the right information that should get out to the public and how do we combat disinformation? And, you know, again, that's a, a, a very difficult scenario, but it is incredibly important, not just here, but also, um, you know, internationally. So, again, I look forward to you know, hearing from, from the, the witnesses on, you know, some thoughts and ideas. And then, you know, out of uh, an abundance of caution, we s did see the administration institute a, a travel ban and, you know, and increase screening of folks that are returning from China and the region. Um, you know, there, there are discussions taking place backwards and, and forwards as to whether that actually will help us get a handle on this, or if the travel ban will actually potentially make things worse. And again, I'd be curious for the perspective of some of the witnesses on how that's being implemented and you know, the, the, the impact uh, of that. And then lastly, you know, part of the reason why I really did want the administration here is we don't see this as a, an adversarial role. A lot of things in, in Washington, D.C. are partisan. This is not partisan. We as Congress understand how rapidly this is moving. We also understand that we want to make sure the administration has all the tools and resources that they need. Right now, we're guessing at what they might need in the emergency supplemental. I would invite the administration to work with us. Tell us what you need, and then we'll work to try to get that available to you as quickly as possible. We're on the same team here. This you know, novel coronavirus doesn't see Republicans or Democrats. It sees human beings, and let's get ahead of this. Let's learn from this. And then let's also plan so we're not constantly responding to the, the latest outbreak, but we're actually thinking about how to prevent the next pandemic, et cetera. So those are a few things that I have on, on my mind. And again, I want to thank the witnesses for, for being here. And we really do have great personnel at CDC, HHS, um, State Department, and they're working overtime. And again, I commend those men and women that are spending quite a bit of time working on this to keep us safe. And we look forward to working with them. And again, this is an open door if they ever want to come to this subcommittee. And, and I thank any of the members here. We're here to help support the administration. And with that, let me turn it over to the ranking member for his opening statement.
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Um, I'd like to thank Chairman Bear for holding this hearing on global spread of novel coronavirus from China. Um, and I, I want to I comment on what you said, the hysteria and misinformation. We saw that when Zika happened, and it, was, it turned into a political fight. It was politicized, and we don't want to do this. And I commend everybody that's working on this to this point. It hasn't happened, and, and I hope we go forward. Uh, and then you have an MD and a veterinarian, and so we're both used to having um, quarantines and dealing with outbreaks. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo from John Hopkins University, Dr. Jennifer Bowie from RAND, and Doc, uh, Mr. Ron Klain. I look forward to hearing from each of you about recent developments and pass forward to coronavirus and related global diseases. As of today, 20,630 people in 24 countries around the world have been infected with coronavirus that we know of. The virus has killed uh, 425 people so far, as we know, uh, or that's all we know of, uh, the vast majority of which have occurred within China. I extend my sympathies to the people in China who have lost family members and remained uh, quarantined by the Chinese authorities in an unprecedented lockdown of millions of people. I don't think we've ever seen this before. However, Despite the severity and infectiousness of this virus, the Chinese government has so far refused to fully cooperate with the global community. And again, this is something we hope does not become politicized. Um, viruses know no borders, and they don't really care what your politics are. Although Chinese scientists were able to share the sequence of the strain with international partners, they were only able to do so after bypassing government censors. So far, China has spurned the help of CDC and refused to provide biological samples to the United States. And to date, if we look back, uh, whether it was the MERS or SARS epidemic, that was a worldwide collaboration. And other countries, even Taiwan, needs to be involved in this because they were the ones that uh, uh, helped solve the SARS epidemic. The slow walking of information and assessments not only hurts the credibility of China, but also hinders our ability as an international community to prevent the further loss of life and spread of the disease. Further in, further, in the middle of the unprecedented crisis, the CCP continues to endanger people throughout Asia by using the World Health Organization to advance its political agenda through the exclusion of Taiwan. Taiwan has also forbidden the evacuation uh, of Taiwan, Taiwanese citizens from the mainland, directly threatening the safety and sovereign um, of their citizens. This can't stand, and again, viruses really don't care what your politics are. The United States should be, be better prepared to face future threats as well, which is why I supported multiple efforts in Congress to promote the One Health Framework, uh, which we're gonna talk a little bit about because this coordinates um, departments, activities, and programs that will prepare to protect the U.S. food and feed supplies in the event of a zoonotic disease outbreak. So this is a cooperation between USDA and HHS. As we know, six to seven out of 10 diseases that we get originate in the animal world, and the coronavirus is a perfect example. Um, the recent outbreak of coronavirus uh, stemming from Wuhan, China, is a perfect example uh, why, uh, for why, manage, why managing the spread of the animal to person spread to prevent person-to-person -person spread is so important. Thankfully, the CDC has repeatedly assured the American people that the risk to our residents remains low. This thanks in large part to the actions taken by the administration in organizing targeted quarantines, travel advisories, research into treatments, and vaccines, in addition to the daily calls our staffs get and members of Congress get on this issue. However, questions remain regarding potential pass forward. What can we do in the future to prevent not just China, but China, any country, from hiding the spread of a deadly virus of which they are repeat offenders? Um, how can we balance long-term pandemic pre preparedness with the billions of dollars our government spends in short-term responses to emerging threats? Congress must continue to enable our agencies to respond effectively to infectious diseases and encourage our government to collaborate with all of our international partners in global health. I look forward to hear this hearing from the panel on response to the spread of the coronavirus in the U.S. and what we can do better to prepare ourselves for the arrival of not just this one, but future pandemics from foreign countries. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you to the ranking member. And you know, my staff was just updating the numbers. It's now 492 deaths, so obviously, 
rapidly flowing and um, you know, constantly being updated. Um, I should have noted that um, it's my pleasure to have had the, the gavel passed over towards me from the, the former chair of, of this committee and I'd um, like to recognize you for a one minute opening statement, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you're to be commended for having the first public hearing on this uh, disease outbreak of either House of Congress. Um, we did get a private briefing from the administration, and let me say that I was impressed by the team that made that presentation to us. Uh, that is, I hope, particularly noteworthy because I'm not a leader when it comes to complimenting the Trump administration. I'm also not a leader in complimenting the government in Beijing, but I think the entire world is impressed when they build a new hospital and put it in service in eight days, which is why I'm surprised that the Chinese government has taken offense that we have chosen to limit travel, because the Chinese government has limited travel internally in China, and of course, Hong Kong has limited uh, travel from the Chinese mainland. What we do to protect our own citizens should not be regarded by the Chinese as an insult, but rather as part of a collective effort to control this disease. We need Chinese cooperation to start clinical trials. There are a variety of possible medicines that might be helpful, but we won't know. One of the good things about this disease is that the, it looks like the mortality rate is 1 to 2 percent. Um, that is much lower than other outbreaks. I realize some people may have slightly different definitions, but it's a lower mortality rate than, say, Ebola that uh, Mr. Klein is, uh, is familiar with. And so it means that without a clinical trial, you don't know whether a particular medicine is successful. Because if you take uh, 20 people with Ebola and you try something out and they all live, that's a good treatment. If you take 20 people with this disease and give them a treatment and they all live, that may have proved nothing at all. So we need double-blind clinical trials. We need cooperation with China. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to getting there. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Um, now, I'm very pleased to welcome our witnesses to today's hearing. We're joined by Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. She'll be followed by Dr. Um, Jennifer Bowie, the Tang Chair in China Policy Studies at the RAND Corporation. Both are trained epidemiologists. And finally, we're joined by Mr. Ron Klein, who coordinated the response to West African Ebola epidemic in 2014 and 2015. Um, please um, summarize your written statements to five minutes, and without objection, your prepared written statements will be made a part of the record. Dr. Nuzzo, if you could begin. Good afternoon. Chairman Barra, Ranking Member Yoho, and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to appear before you today to talk, discuss the emergence and global spread of the 2019 novel coronavirus. In the last two months since this virus was first identified, we've learned several important things, such as its potential to spread between people and its capacity to cause a spectrum of disease ranging from mild to severe. These discoveries have changed our perceptions of the global risk that the vi this virus poses, but there are still critical unknowns for which we urgently need more information. Though more and more cases are reported each day, we don't yet know the true size and geographic scope of this epidemic. And those many countries are not capable of actively searching for cases. And those countries that have implemented surveillance are likely missing cases, perhaps large numbers of them. Severity of this disease is another key unknown. Because of biases in the way we look for cases, it's difficult for us to estimate from the case numbers how much severe illness and death we may expect to see as this epidemic grows. That said, even though we can't get a precise estimate, there are some emerging signs that this virus may be less severe than we initially feared. If these trends continue, we, will ultimately, we may ultimately downgrade our concerns about this virus. But for now, these uncertainties leave important gaps in our response planning. Though this, the ultimate trajectory of this epidemic is hard to predict with certainty, evidence is mounting each day that it may not be possible to contain this virus. What this means if, is that if it's not possible to completely stop disease transmission, we must plan for how we will mitigate the impacts of the virus as it spreads. To do this, I recommend three priority actions. First, we need to seriously re-examine the current policy of banning travel from China and quarantining returning travelers. 
All of the evidence we have indicates that travel restrictions and quarantines directed at individual countries are unlikely to keep the virus out of our borders. These measures may exacerbate the epidemic's social and economic tolls and can make us less safe. Simply put, this virus is spreading too quickly and too silently, and our surveillance is too limited for us to truly know which countries have active transmission and which don't. The virus could enter the U.S. from other parts of the world not on our restricted list, and it may already be circulating here. The U.S. was a target of travel bans and quarantines during the 20, 2009 flu pandemic. It didn't work to stop the spread, and it hurt our country. I am concerned that by our signaling out China for travel bans, we are effectively penalizing it for reporting cases. This may diminish its willingness to further share data and chill other countries' willingness to be transparent about their own outbreaks. Travel bans and quarantines will make us less safe if they divert attention and resources from higher priority disease mitigation approaches that we know are needed to respond to cases within the United States. Caring for and monitoring even a small number of quarantine individuals will be highly challenging for health departments and may siphon attention from other more important response work. And we're already hearing stories about chaos in the states as they're trying to implement these recent policies. Second, rather than penalize China, we should try to assist it in responding to the epidemic. Helping China has, is in our best interests. There's a risk that the drastic actions that China is taking to control the epidemic could lead to disruptions in U.S. supplies of essential medical resources, such as personal protective equipment and critical medicines. We need to examine this possibility and identify ways to ensure that the epidemic, or the U.S. response to it, doesn't interrupt medical supply chains. Third, we should focus on health response efforts that we know will help to lessen the impacts of the virus within U.S. communities. We need to ensure that federal, state, and local health agencies and hospitals and health clinics have the resources they need to diagnose, isolate, and safely treat cases, and to promote feasible approaches to, to disease mitigation that are most likely to reduce disease spread, minimize disruption, and protect those most likely to experience severe illness and death. For this, we need leadership and additional investments, possibly in the form of emergency funding, such as was appropriated during the 2009 pandemic. Government leadership is also needed to facilitate the development of medical countermeasures, including infectious disease diagnostics. The points I've raised today hopefully paint a picture of an epidemic that is in many ways complex and evolving, but for which we are increasingly gaining clarity. One thing is certain, international collaboration will be essential for us to monitor, for continue monitoring and learning about the virus and to inform our own response plans. That we know anything about this virus is due in large part to information contributed by China, Thailand, Vietnam. These are countries that have worked hard to improve their surveillance, in part with U.S. help, and we will likely need their help going forward. We should recognize these success as they demonstrate the value of our investments and the need for continued international engagement. Though our instincts may be to isolate ourselves to try to keep the virus out of our borders, this approach may only weaken our preparedness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nuzzo. Nuzzo. Dr. Bowie. Thank you. Chairman Barra, uh, Ranking Member Yoho, and members of subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify for this coronavirus outbreak. My testimony will start with laying out the context of this outbreak by looking at China's public health development after SARS. Then I will examine China's current response to this outbreak, and I'll end with some recommendations. 17 years ago, SARS emerged from southern China and caused a global outbreak and infecting over 8,000 people and killing more than 700. SARS prompted China to radically rethink its public health system. The country invested heavily in the Centers for Disease Control, surveillance networks, and the National Influenza Center. SARS also spurred China to strengthen its relationship with the United States and the wider international community uh, around public health concerns. The U.S. helped China in both public health infrastructure and capacity building. Public health professionals from both countries collaborated on HIV AIDS, avian flu, swine flu, H7N9, and Ebola. In the last couple of years, however, this relationship has faltered due to tensions between the U.S.-China uh, relationship. Compared to SARS, the time taken for the Chinese government and the global health community to respond to the first cases of coronavirus are much shorter. 
So uh, there were about four weeks from the first notice case to the public announcement of the outbreak. And then 12 days to the time when virus was identified. And then nine more days until the national case report system was triggered. The credit for this progress can be tied to the availability of the latest genomic sequencing technology and the global data uh, networks. Because of the rapid uh, identifica and identification of the virus, many countries, including US and China, can now quickly develop a testing kit, monitor the genetic mutations, and have better understanding of the trans transmission. All countries can link their cases to the current outbreak now. Further, the wide use of social media in China's progress on globalization has pushed the government to be more transparent. However, there are remaining similarities uh, to the SARS response. Given the Chinese government values stability most, an outbreak by its nature is disruptive. The government's hesitation to announce the public health threat was reflected in the long review process and the regulations that prohibiting local officials and the members of pub public discuss outbreak before the approval from the central government. The downplay of the severity of the outbreak also has happen, happened again. From January 3rd to the, sec, uh, to the 20th, the expert investigation team assured the public that there was limited person-to-person -person transmission. And after closing the animal markets that associated with the first group of cases, the epidemic was under control. It was not until cases outside China appeared that the second team was sent and confirmed the communal transmission. Then the government uh, announced a public health emergency and triggered the national case reporting system. Finally, as with SARS, the government uses mass quarantine as the primary intervention. Resources have been mobilized nationally to support the health care system in the crisis areas, and even new hospitals were built uh, for the outbreak. The quarantine and health care system uh, 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 strengthen our important strategies, but we do not, do not know yet if such intervention can contain this epidemic, nor, nor do we know about the social, cultural, economic, and the political in, in, implication and impacts. I'll highlight the three recommendations here. First, USG should consider having a concerted and comprehensive plan to contain the domestic outbreak. In addition to the social distancing action we just mentioned, um, we should consider uh, the strategies to re reduce the spread of the rumors and the stigma associated with the out outbreaks. Second, public health and humanitarian assistance should be sent at this time when China is bearing the principal burden of the outbreak. Currently, 99% of the cases are in China and 97% of the deaths in the Hubei province. Public health expertise, um, medical supplies, and even supporting language can help the people who are suffering there. And lastly, given the continued spread of the outbreak, USG should consider working with WHO and China CDC to provide strategic and capacity building for other countries that are in danger of epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Mr. Klein. Uh, Chairman Barra, Ranking Member Yoho, other members of the subcommittee, thanks for having me. I, move you, I commend you for moving quickly to hold this hearing. At the outset, I want to make two preliminary points. First, while scientists are working at unprecedented speed to learn more about this virus, we still know less about the coronavirus today than we did about Ebola in 2014. There are many important gaps to be filled in. Secondly, I want to say a word about partisanship. I am a political partisan, that's well known, but I testify today the same way I approached serving as Ebola response coordinator, putting politics aside. Epidemic response should not be a partisan issue. The coronavirus will certainly not ask anyone's political affiliation before affecting them. With that introduction, I want to turn to the lessons from the Ebola response. That response was not without problems, and particularly early on, but ultimately President Obama launched a whole of government effort he appointed me to lead a team at the White House to coordinate it. The President ordered the first ever deployment of U.S. troops to combat an epidemic. He implemented innovative policies on in travel screening and monitoring and worked with this body to pass a $5.4 billion bipartisan emergency response package. This response improved preparedness at home and put over 10,000 people, civilians and soldiers, government employees, contractors, and NGO members 
on the ground in Africa to help, a gargantuan effort. The epidemic was tragic, a loss of 11,000 lives or more, but experts had forecast a death toll of more than one million. Thus, as part of a global response, with Africans playing the largest part, America helped save hundreds of thousands of lives. Here at home, after some initial missteps in Dallas, no one contracted Ebola on U.S. soil, and the evacuation of Americans from Africa with Ebola saved lives and resulted in no spread of the disease here. And the benefits of this response continue to this day. With Congress's support, we stood up a national network of medical facilities that remain prepared now to respond to cases of dangerous infectious disease. Nothing like that existed before. The response helped develop an effective Ebola vaccine being used now in Central Africa, and new therapeutics have dramatically reduced the mortality rate of Ebola. Tom Friedman recently wrote that the Ebola response was, quote, President Obama's most significant foreign policy achievement, for which he got little credit precisely because it worked, demonstrating that without America as a quarterback, important things that save lives and advance freedom often don't happen, end quote. Now, the challenges we face now from the novel coronavirus have many differences from those that Ebola posed but also some key similarities. I want to try to quickly run through seven lessons from the Ebola response that should be applied today. First, in a scenario like this one, there is no substitute for White House leadership. There should be a single high-level official inside the National Security Council overseeing the response. At the end of my tenure as Ebola response coordinator, President Obama accepted my recommendation to create a permanent pandemic preparedness and response directorate inside the NSC. President Trump initially continued this structure but unfortunately, in July of 2018, he disbanded this unit. The gap that created for this, for this response is significant. Now, last week's decision to create a task force to oversee the coronavirus response is a valuable step, but I think it's insufficient. That is not a criticism of its chair, Secretary Azar, for whom I have great respect, but reflects the fundamentals of bureaucratic behavior, the realities of the competing demands on a cabinet secretary's time, and the need to ensure foreign engagement at a high level. This response should be led by a full-time senior appointee at the White House. Second, the U.S. must lean forward to fight this epidemic overseas. Unlike West Africa in 2014, China today would not accept thousands of U.S. responders on the ground. But that doesn't mean our focus is limited to the homeland. Nations poorer than China may see outbreaks and need direct help. Our diplomats should be engaged around the globe. The best way to keep Americans safe is to eschew isolationism and help other nations combat the virus. Third, this administration must ensure that science and expertise guide our actions. There are going to be many hard decisions in the days ahead. The American people are fortunate to have the world's leading experts on infectious disease working in this government, experts who have served Democratic and Republican presidents alike. This expertise should be paramount in decision making. Fourth, the administration should quickly transmit to Congress an emergency funding package to respond to the coronavirus challenge. Federal agencies, state and local governments, hospitals testing and treating patients will need assistance. Research and deployment of new therapeutics and vaccines need government support. While the response has benefited from the new emergency fund that Congress created on a bipartisan basis last year, that probably will not suffice. The Trump administration should send an appropriate funding request to this body. Fifth, the Congress must do its job in dealing with the coronavirus. It needs to act on any such request quickly and should perhaps work now to be ready for it. In addition, hearings like today's are very important. The emergency fund needs to be increased and paired with a fund to support the development of therapeutics and vaccines on public-private partnerships. And finally, Congress must renew funding for the full network of Ebola and special pathogen hospitals created in 2014. It's set to expire in May. Sixth, there should be a wake-up call to finish the work we need on pandemic preparedness. Recently, we marked the 100th anniversary of the single largest mortality event in American history the Spanish flu epidemic. At present, it seems very unlikely that the coronavirus poses a similar threat. But even if this epidemic is not the big one, as Representative Yoho said, it's a reminder that the danger lurks and it will come. The Global Health Security Agenda, bipartisan commissions and reports, and my own writings have set forth detailed agendas of what we need to do to prepare for this event, but have largely been ignored. The time to act is now. And seventh, finally, all of us need to be on the watch for discrimination against Chinese Americans and speak out strongly against it. The coronavirus strikes humans, not people of any particular race or ethnicity. Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants in America are no more likely to get this disease or transmit it than anyone else. 
It's critical to speak out against discrimination. Americans need to pull together to fight a disease, not pull apart to fight one another. Thank you again for having me, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Klein, and thank you to, to all the witnesses. Um, I'll now recognize myself for uh, opening questions, and then I'll recognize the ranking member and other members for five minutes for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. Um, let's touch on a, a, a couple areas that I think each of you touched on in your opening statement. Um, I understand the, the initial reaction to say, you know, let's try to contain this virus um, at the epicenter in, in, in China. But, you know, just given the worldwide spread of these cases, how little we know about the, the, the transmission at, at, at this juncture, it seems as though, you know, we're beyond the, the point of, you know, trying to contain this at the epicenter. Um, maybe starting with you, Dr. News, and, and uh, you know, just going that, down the line, how effective uh, is this travel ban? And you touched it on it, um, that it actually may worsen, worsen things right now and concentrate things, so. Thank you, Chairman Barra. Um, I, as I mentioned, am worried about the implications of the travel ban. Um, we often see when we have emerging disease outbreaks, our first instinct is to try to lock down travel to prevent the introduction of virus to our country. And that is a completely understandable instinct. Um, I have never seen instances in which that has worked when we are talking about a virus at this scale. Respiratory viruses like this one, and like others, they just move quickly. They are hard to spot because they look like many other diseases. It's very difficult to interrupt them at borders. You would need to have complete surveillance in order to do that, and we simply don't have that. In China, we're looking for largely sick people. In the other countries, we are only looking for people from China. So we are going to miss transmission elsewhere. So for that and other reasons, I do not believe that it will be able to keep the virus out of our border. I am, though, very worried about the uh, potential diversion of resources, because this um, was apparently a, a, um, it was a decision that caught many public health folks off guard. And they are now trying to figure out what to do. And so I talked to one health department um, who has 31 staff working around the clock, supporting two quarantined individuals. And I just think as this epidemic grows, that's not likely to scale. Right. Um, so I'm worried about that. And then I'm also worried about the chilling effect that it sends, the potential to um, erode um, what, uh, in a relationship with China that we are critically dependent on right now for our su the supplies and the things that we need to be able to manage our own cases, but also um, we just need more information, and as you mentioned in your opening remarks, China will be the source for that information um, in large part. Right. You know, maybe, um, Mr. Clay, Dr. Nuzo touched on the supply chains and the interconnectedness of, how concerned should we be about um, those supply chains and, and, you know, obviously they're global supply chains as well and, and the medical supplies potentially needed here but, but also in China? Yes, Congressman, I mean, we, we don't have a travel ban. We have a travel band-aid right now. Um, first, before it was imposed, 300,000 people came here from China in the previous month, so the horse is out of the barn. Uh, second, what we have restricted is not travel to or from China, but passports to and from China. Uh, there's no restriction on Americans going back and forth. There are warnings. People should abide by those warnings. But today, 30 planes will land in Los Angeles that either originated in Beijing or came here on one stop. 30 in San Francisco, 25 in New York City, okay? So unless we think that the color of the passport someone carries is a meaningful public health restriction, we have not placed a meaningful public health restriction. And then to get to your question, uh, exempt from the president's travel restriction, of course, is the import of goods from China and, of course, the people who fly the planes and drive the boats that bring those goods from China. We couldn't ban that activity we vitally need that. 90% of the antibiotics in this country come from China. Uh, all kinds of vital medical supplies. Dr. Nuzo mentioned the PPP, PPE we will use to treat people. So travel bans, uh, even putting aside Dr. Nuzo's concern, that's not what we're imposing. That's not what exists. What we should be focused on is monitoring the people who are here, 
who have been in China in the past 14 days. That is complicated, that is hard. We built a path-breaking system to do that in the Ebola response. This is much larger and more complicated, and I don't think we've heard answers. I hope Congress will get them, but what the administration is doing on that, which really should be our public health priority. And maybe in the limited time I have left, Dr. Vu, you have a unique perspective having trained in China. Um, and you know, from your perspective, how best can we assist the Chinese? And again, from the congressional perspective, we're not looking at this as adversarially. We're looking at this as collaboratively. Great. Thank you. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Nuzzo and Mr. Klein that uh, the travel ban doesn't, cause, doesn't help that much in this, the current situation. I want everyone to understand that uh, China, uh, Chinese scientists look up to the American scientists highly because the uh, United States has helped China to build the public health system and has helped with capacity building after SARS. Um, so for, for they always looking at U.S. as a leader uh, in this field. And for U.S. to make this decision, uh, so I think that's why China is a little bit surprised and, and also feel hurt. And I also, my, my own feeling is that with the travel ban, uh, there should come with other policies. It should not be the only policy that U.S. announced to, to China. The humanitarian aid, the public health assistance, and uh, the other uh, support should be in place as, at the same time as the travel ban. I'm out of time. Let me go ahead and recognize the ranking member, Mr. Yeo from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, great testimony. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I've got a ton of questions. Let me go through. Dr. Nuzo, you said we should look to help China versus back, uh, blocking them out. What kind of help would you recommend other than what we've done? Uh, keep in mind, if China won't accept our offer to help uh, with the CDC, what else can we do? I would like to hear from you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, uh, ranking member Yoho for that question. Um, first of all, I, I want to make clear that I think one of the concerns that I have about our... Dr. Nuzo, um, could you speak into the microphone? Excuse me, sorry. I want to make clear um, one of the concerns that I have um, pertains to not just our response to this virus, but also how China is responding. And the disruptions that I spoke to earlier, um, I believe, will be exacerbated by the lockdowns that China um, is taking in an attempt to control the virus. Uh, since those lockdowns have been announced, every single province in China is reporting cases. So I am increasingly not convinced that those measures are helping, and I am really worried that they are going to cause disruptions. And so I think it is essential that we um, encourage China, pressure China, whatever the, the, the um, negotiations that we do, to pursue um, strategies for controlling the virus that are not going to be disruptive, that will not um, suspend the production of critical medical supplies because people can't get to their jobs. Let me interrupt you right there because yeah. that's something I want to talk about. Sure. Um, you know, does the fact that China did a massive quarantine, our reports are 50 to 58 million people have been quarantined, does that concern you in addition to the rapid construction of the 1,000-bed hospital, which was a monumental feat, and they've got another 1,500 beds going in. So China is putting a, a stellar effort into this. Um, that alone, I would think, would be a concern for all of us. If they're that concerned about it, yet the information coming out is, well, we got it kind of under control. Um, and then the furloughing of workers. Uh, I've heard up to some, they're told not to come back till sometime in March. Uh, I think this is a big concern that we need to look at, and I'm all for quarantine if it's done properly, but as Dr. Bowie said, it can't be the only thing. You've got to have a systematic way of you're doing it. I mean, we do that with equines, uh, with influenza outbreaks and shows, and it's not, somebody asked me, well, do you care more about horses than people, or do you want to treat people like horses? I'm like, no, but do we put more emphasis on our animals than we do our people? This is a national security thing, and we can't afford it. And if the economic impact that China's going to feel I think that's something that we need to look at very seriously, that this has the potential. And I want to bring up, does anybody know the duplication rate of this virus compared to influenza or SARS? Um, I completely agree with your concerns about the internal um, response. I do not believe that the massive lockdowns in China will lead to a cessation of transmission of the virus. Um, I think that it is 
already causing a tremendous amount of disruption. When you hear stories about people having to walk to the hospital, sick people having to walk to the hospital because transportation has been shut down, that really raises warning flags in terms of the public health benefits of these measures. But that, doesn't that also show you, show you the, the, the severe threat that the Chinese see themselves? Um, I think that everybody is viewing this severely. I, I will tell you that many of these tendencies we saw during SARS as well, and we often see when there is an emerging infectious disease outbreak like this. All right, I want to go to Mr. Klein because he's yeah. jumping over here. Thank, thank you, I appreciate that, Congressman. Look, I think that there are two points uh, that I will make, uh, well, three. One, I, I agree that there are a lot of signs here that this may be more severe in China than has been reported, and I have no doubt that the actual number of cases is significantly higher than Well, let me tell you what I heard yesterday from reliable sources. It's over 100,000 people been yeah. exposed. Yeah, what I, we've heard, and that duplication rate with influenza was about 1.3 percent. That means one person can affect about 1.3 people, and that was the same with SARS, a little bit higher for SARS. This one they're estimating right now between 2.5 to 3. So that means one person is affecting 2.5 to 3 people, and that's not being reported. And if that's true, and the Chinese know that, they need to let that us know because that shows you the virulence of that and the, the rapid spread. Yeah, the, the, I agree. We don't really know what the R-naught is. We don't know a lot of this facts. We need to get this information. I agree. Last thing I want to say is about this Chinese internal quarantine. Um, uh, just to put a finer point on what Dr. Nuzzo said, I'm highly skeptical that this is effective. You know, I think we all saw that picture of all the bridges out of Wuhan uh, with no one leaving. But if you looked at that picture, on the other side were literally thousands of trucks on their way into Wuhan. Who drove those trucks and what happened after they unloaded them? Think about trying to quarantine a city the size of New York City in the United States and imagine that no one would come in and no one would go out. How would you feed those people? Who would run the power plants That's and all these things? going to be so, found out in the future. Yeah, and so what, what I'm willing to bet right now is that people are coming and going from Wuhan every day. And, uh, and it's just the practical reality of the size and the scope of what we're talking about. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman from California. First, this outbreak uh, shows the um, wrongheadedness, almost immorality, of the Chinese government excluding Taiwan from the World Health Organization. Uh, we've got to be on team human, not on team disease. Um, and whenever something new like this happens, we react. Almost always it's an overreaction until there's that one case where the reaction is not an overreaction. Uh, we are in a race uh, to develop vaccines and cures, and that can happen only with cooperation between the United States and China. Um, we look back at November 2002, when it took months uh, for the scale of Chinese SARS crisis to be exposed. This time, uh, as the New York Times uh, reported, uh, at critical moments in the first seven weeks between the appearance of the first symptoms in early December uh, and today, uh, the government's decision it, at, between when the first appearance and the government's decision to lock down the city. Officials chose to put secrecy and order ahead of openly uh, confronting the growing crisis. Um, so I'll ask uh, each of our witnesses, are the Chinese being honest as to the extent of the epidemic? Does the World Health Organization have sufficient access to facilities and to patients? Doctor? I can't speak to intention. I think there have been critical information gaps. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I am particularly uh, interested in learning more about and think we should have more information about is about the severity of cases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, to, to the point about how is the situation more severe than they're letting us know? Are there more deaths or dying that we're not hearing about? Okay. Um, one puzzling feature so far is that the cases that we have seen outside of China have been far more mild than what's going on in China. So we need to understand why that is. And for that, we need access to more data. I have been encouraged that there have been a number of scientific publications that have come out already about this, 
with Chinese and, and, and other um, and, and scientists from elsewhere on those, um, on those publications. But um, I, as an academic, can't even justify waiting for a publication to learn uh, about these things. So I absolutely believe that more information is critical. Okay, um, I, I do have a limited time. Uh, the Chinese have reported uh, 24,000 cases and 490 deaths. Uh, Dr. Bully, uh, what? what uh, my observation. What, what do you think the number is? Right. Uh, my observation is that uh, there was delay uh, of case reporting for sure before January 19th. After Jan January 19th, the, the government triggered the public health emergency, mm -hmm. and that triggers the, nas the uh, national case reporting system. That case system was uh, implemented after SARS. And as uh, if you know SARS better uh, well, uh, then you, you know that at the end of the SARS, when they set up the system, they said, uh, they put it in law that every, the, if anyone cannot report the, the accurate numbers, then they will be punished. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, that's very I, I, well. I've got to go to but the other, I asked. The, the problem you, is. Excuse the, me, yeah. I have limited time. Um, the, the, the Chinese have not involved the United States experts to the degree they should. Are they, do we have uh, sufficient numbers of uh, people from Europe, Japan, and the World Health Organization on the ground uh, to get us uh, the information and to see that we're doing all, uh, all we can to look for, uh, for, for, for cures and vaccines? Uh, Mr. Klein. I don't think so, Congressman. And again, this is one reason why I think we need a high-level coordinator at the White House who can be in touch with high foreign governments at other high levels. I have, again, Secretary Azar is competent and skilled, but this is an act of diplomacy, not just health diplomacy, but high-level diplomacy. Our president should be on the phone with President Xi. You know, we should be engaging these other countries at a very high level. That's what we did during the Ebola response, very high level from the White House. And I think we need to do that here to get more American eyes on the ground. Well, again, here, I, I was nationals. asking not just about the U.S. Can, do, do, do any of our witnesses know the level of WHO, European and Japanese uh, experts on the ground in China? And is that sufficient? Is, is China cooperating with any of the other advanced uh, uh, health organizations in the world? My source is the news, uh, and I know that the WHO has announced that they, they, will, they, are, they have a, a team uh, on ground. And I thought they have that a what? US, they have an emergency team mm -hmm. in, in Beijing. And uh, I think the director of the WHO was in Beijing, I think, since January 27th. My time has expired. Right. Let me recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Thank the witnesses. We have ample evidence that China has undue influence over many UN organizations, including the WHO. Um, the WHO continues to exclude Taiwan, that is an important player in this and many other things. Um, do, you, do all of you think that we can just unilaterally trust the World Health Organization to give an impartial assessment of China's response to the coronavirus? I'll start. I certainly don't think so, Congressman Perry. I think um, the WHO is performing better now than it was during the Ebola response five years ago. I think new leadership has helped. But I think the delay in declaring a public health emergency and international concern reflected Chinese influence there. And I think that, uh, you know, the WHO is just one uh, aspect of this response. They aren't going to treat people. They aren't doing research. They're important. The U.S. should support the WHO, but we need to be involved directly on our own in China and with our allies. Okay, so that's fair. They've been complimentary of China's response, but critical of other nations. Does, I mean, do you take pause when you hear that? Or, Mr. Klein, just for example, you're I guess a self-described expert, having your uh, involvement with Ebola, have you been critical of China's response? Uh, uh, yes, I have, sir. I've published in everything I've written about this so far that the Chinese have failed the test of transparency and cooperation, and that they they uh, they definitely need to do better. We should be very concerned about that, and we should be, as I just said a moment ago, engaging the Chinese government at the highest levels to press them do to you do better. Know, this should be at the top of our agenda Mr. Klain, in our relations with China, I sir. Do you know if President Trump has or has not talked to the president of China 
about this? I do not, sir. You don't know, right? I do so, not. I mean, it's, it, you would admit it's a little unfair to criticize him here when you just said you don't know if he, he – maybe has, maybe hasn't. I don't know, but you're well, making the claim here that, that he should have done it or should be doing it. Uh, my claim is that he should have done it or should be doing it. I will say he hasn't said that he done it, and the officials reiterate yeah. that the Chinese aren't cooperating yet. Mr. Klain, you worked on the Ebola virus outbreak in Sierra Leone, Leone Guyana, and Liberia. Is that is West Africa? Is that about right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Are any of those nations communist nations? Not to the best of no, my knowledge. Right? Are any of those nations seeking worldwide dominance over the United States of America, stealing somewhere between three hundred and six hundred billion dollars in intellectual property annually, including medical technology? Uh, no, sir. I, as I said, I'm not here to defend China or its response to this virus. In fact, I've been critical about China and its response to this virus in virtually every answer I've given to the subcommittee today. So. In your view, what is the first responsibility of the United States government regarding a pandemic, the coronavirus, Ebola? What is the first responsibility of the United States government? The first responsibility of this government is to keep the American people safe. Is to keep and the, the American best people way, safe. That's right. Yes, sir. And the best way to do that, as we did with Ebola, as we do with other things, is being engaged globally in helping nations fight these diseases overseas so they so, don't come so here, are sir. You, are you advocating for a travel ban outright to China or from China? I'm trying to get that from your initial testimony. I couldn't tell where you were. You were critical of the current situation, but you didn't offer your solution set as a as an expert, so to speak. Sir, I did offer my solution set. It was that we monitor carefully everyone who has come to this country from China recently. How many people travel from China to the United States every single day, sir? Well, before this outbreak, it was about 8,000 a day. 8,000 a, a day? Yes, sir. And, and it's your studied opinion that we should let that happen unencumbered, unimpeded under all circumstances and monitor those 8,000 people a day's whereabouts should this uh, continue to progress and we found an outbreak in the United States of America. Congressman, it's my studied opinion that we will never reduce that to zero due to trade and due to the travel of Americans and Americans' family members. In fact, the President's order exempts 11 different categories of people from going back and forth to China, as well as hundreds of people a day bringing goods so it's, here. It's, it's, and so it's given, that, zero given that hundreds, all. no, sir, given that hundreds of people, thousands of people will come here every day, I say, it, sir, it's not your position that American citizens in China should be stranded there and unable to come back. And given that, then the only practical thing we can do is to monitor those who are coming here to this country, who are bringing medicines to this country, who are bringing goods may, and May I this close country. with my, that the time like that I have? That seems like the practical solution, Mr. Klain, we appreciate your experience. We do. And, and your expertise, because you've done this to a certain extent. But I don't think that you've operated in the same realm with, a Chi with, the, with the Chinese Communist government and, the, and, and their actions towards the United States, so things are a little different. And the other thing is, is that while you had a certain experience, it might not be the only way of doing things. And so while it's great to throw partisan shots, I mean, when you talked about bringing, I, I read your piece in the Atlantic, sir. I mean, you talk about bringing countries in the United States together and not being paranoid. All you did was offer criticism and really no help, and that's not helpful at all, and well, I yield back. Well, Congressman, that piece uh, included praise for Secretary Azar for the other aspects of the response, praise for the administration's response to a limited extent in Congo to Ebola we've seen there. Uh, I open by saying this isn't a partisan issue, and I reiterate that this is not a partisan issue. What I do believe, though, is that if we don't engage globally, and again, I've been very critical of the Chinese, we can't keep America safe, sir. And, and I would agree with you, but instead of blaming America, you ought to look more towards the Chinese, not you. Great. And again, the, the goal here is we want to be supportive of the administration. Congress wants to be on the same page with the administration. And we want to work with the Chinese to get ahead of this, because this is a global issue. With that, let me recognize Ms. Hu Lam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for coming today. I'm actually really intrigued by uh, Dr. Nuzzo and Dr. Bui, your initial conversations about the fact that the travel bans and quarantines weren't necessarily the solution. I guess I'm really struggling trying to understand, based on my limited understanding of biology, I'm, I'm a mere engineer, um, why is quarantining not appropriate? Why is it something that's not useful in this case? How do we know what cases it is useful in? Because my limited understanding of biology is quarantine 
screening works, uh, is there ever a situation where that would be something that would be useful and when do we know when it is before it's too late? Um, thank you so much. I, I'll um, start with answering that question. Um, the challenge here is that we are talking about a respiratory virus that it potentially has, and I take the earlier points, there are still some uncertainties about the incubation period, but potentially can spread between people quite quickly. So it is very difficult to know where the disease is spreading because you just simply can't get a hold of it, ahead of it in terms of your surveillance. So those sorts of circumstances um, make quarantine challenging because we don't know who we should be quarantining fully. Um, we may decide just based on the numbers of cases in China that we should uh, quarantine travelers from China. But we don't actually know if travelers from other countries have the virus. We also don't know if it's already here because we are only testing people who have a, have a connection to China. So that makes it challenging. Um, and quarantine is actually not something that we routinely use in public health, despite what you may have heard. It's actually a, um, something that we only use in very rare circumstances. We in public health, when we talk about quarantine, we mean restricting the movement of people that are not yet sick. We very frequently isolate people that we know are sick. That's a very routine and um, well-studied uh, process. But quarantine is not something we routinely do. It's usually reserved for circumstances in which you have a small group of people, perhaps right. in a measles outbreak, in a vaccine-hesitant community. And so is this a there. situation where you'll know, when you see it, you'll know that this is a quarantining situation and an effective one, and this just doesn't happen to be one, or we're just speculating? I, I, in this situation, this is, does, definitely does not happen to be and, one. And Dr. Bowie? My sense of a quarantine is a primary prevention. So it's basically separating the, those who are sick versus those who are not sick. So without a vaccine, without a treatment, usually we have to rely on quarantine on paper, on paper it work. But I, in reality, I often only slow the transmission, not prevent. So I'm sorry to interrupt because I do have very limited time. And so when you talk about the vaccine or, or treatment, uh, is there anything that we can do in the short term with this particular situation with uh, vaccinations or treatment uh, from a congressional standpoint? Is there anything that we should be able to do from a forward-looking perspective because this may not be as bad as it seems to have been at least initially, but at some point it will be, something will be. I guess this is probably for Mr. Klain. Can you talk to anything you mentioned, maybe emergency supplemental funding? Can you identify what programs specifically or what accounts would be useful, not just for this particular situation, but for future situations as well? Yes, Congresswoman. I think it's very. I think Congress last year expanded the public health emergency fund, considered but did not adopt a proposal to create a special fund to help seed public-private partnerships to accelerate the development of vaccines and therapeutics. And I think while that would probably be too late to really help with this uh, epidemic, it might not be, and certainly will be very helpful going forward. I think you know, that means putting more money also into BARDA, which plays an important part in turning this research and bringing it to the marketplace. We're always underfunded and always a little bit behind. But I, but I think uh, you know, whatever Congress could do to supplement public-private partnerships in this regard would be very useful for keeping the American people safe. Thank you. And with the last minute of my time, Dr. Bui, I was wondering, you did comment on the fact that there would be potential uh, social, cultural, political, and economic implications to our current strategy, that you kind of left it at that. Can you elaborate? Uh, on what those kind, I know you said we don't know what they are, but could you speculate? I was referring to the quarantine uh, measures in, in China. Certainly economic concern is huge. Um, and I think even China's government probably is considering, you know, how long this quarantine can actually, without hard, harming the uh, economy too, too much. Um, and of course it has social and cultural issues. Uh, people are being quarantined are worried uh, they are, nervous and uh, especially for the hospitals within Wuhan, they are overwhelmed. Uh, certainly the new hospital will help a little bit and uh, the um, uh, mobilization of resources help a little bit, but for people under quarantine it's a, s a tremendous stress. Uh, politically, of course, there's a, uh, there are lots of distrust, uh, lots of uh, questions within China now. And um, again, quarantine, uh, uh, lockdown a whole city usually is not uh, the best practice. Uh, thank you. I've run out of time. I yield back. Great. Thank you. Let me recognize Mr. Mass from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <clears throat> want to take a step back and ask that we all recall we have districts back home 
And while we deal with national policy, uh, the questions that we ask on this matter to individuals, individuals with children, individuals that go to work, individuals that are exposed to people that travel. We will all travel presumably Friday or Saturday back to our home districts. We're in a very international city here. And uh, I, I think, I, I feel as though the sense that I'm getting from you all about quarantine not being the right path does not pass the test of common sense. But I don't want to dwell on that right at this moment. Uh, what I want to ask first, number one, in the aim of speaking about people that we represent back home, if you were in Wuhan right now, any one of you, you all have experience with this, what would be your first or second or third line of defense? How would you protect your family? How would you protect yourself? Would you wear a mask? Would you wash your hands? Does that not work? Would you not touch your eyes or your nose? Would you prevent your kids from going to school? What would, what would you do? Can I start with, uh, I think, uh, and there are many other primary uh, prevention methods. Uh, health education is one. Uh, I think if people understand what's going on, and they, they understand the severity of the issue, and you let them know that how can they protect themselves and their families and, and their children. That's the question I asked. If you could answer that for me, it would be fantastic. That would be, you know, through social media, through any channel we can have. Social hide. media is not protecting anybody in the Wuhan. Knowledge, right the knowledge. What do they do to protect themselves? So if there are people that come to our country because there is no quarantine on them because of this academic approach instead of common sense approach, what do people do to protect themselves when they are exposed to others? I think what confused me about your question initially is the, the if you were in Wuhan, and I can't speculate, I don't know what the situation is happening in Wuhan. As I mentioned before, one of the great unknowns about this virus is the apparent discrepancy in what we are hearing about in terms of severity and illness in China versus the more close to 150 cases that have been reported outside of China. The majority of the, the cases that have been reported outside of China um, have largely been mild disease, like other respiratory illnesses. I apologize for cutting you off, but none of you are answering a very straightforward question. Mr. Klain, the, you're mm -hmm. presumably the expert on this panel. If you were there at ground zero, maybe you're not in, in a, a full-on tap suit, but what would you do if your family was going to be in an area that was exposed to it? How would you protect your family from this? What is defense one? Yeah. So, uh, Congressman, I think this goes back to your initial point, which is defense one would be to get out. And the problem, I think, for this issue of travel bans and quarantines is that probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people have. Okay. Thank you. Number one, get out. Right. Number two, you're, number two you can't would be, get out, would you're be, there. Number two, what would you Would do? be social distancing, would be trying to have fewer interactions with people. You asked about keeping your children home from school. What we found in the past is when that happens, people's children leave the house and go to shopping malls and other places where they have contact with people. So, you know, it's, it's a tricky How thing. How would you physically protect yourself? Uh, I, I, the only real way, I think, to physically protect yourself is to try to stay away from other people. I think uh, if you're going to have exposure to other people, as we all do, you know, washing your hands, doing things to minimize the spread of the virus is good. But, uh, you know, get out of where the virus is, stay away from other people, and then engage in standard, uh, you know, public health kind of practices, wash your hands, wh whatever. I mean, we don't say whatever. This is a serious question. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, washing your hands might be a simple act, but it's a very serious thing when you're looking yeah. at a pandemic like this. Um, Dr. Bowie, one of your last comments that you made was about quarantine perhaps only slowing the transmission. Is there at this point a vaccine? No. Oh. So would slowing the transmission be a victory? No. Well, it's a victory for other cities, other countries. Is it a victory America. for the United States of America? It's a victory for human being. So it is a victory to slow that, that being something that comes from quarantine. I think so. From, and I'm from not quarantine. all against the quarantine. I'm just saying the quarantine policy should be evaluated very often. Not yeah. every seven days, every, every month, you know, it should be Can evaluated. Congressman, my, my concerns about the travel policy is not an academic concern. 
It's that as a practical matter, people are coming here from China every day, every day. And, and we couldn't stop that unless your district doesn't want antibiotics and protective and all the things that come from China every single day. And so we need to be honest about the American people, with the American people about the fact that we can't keep people coming here from China. We're not gonna keep Americans from coming home for goodness sakes. And there's no reason to think that a foreign national or an American are any more or less likely to transmit the disease. In fact, we, we think they aren't. So I think reducing the number of the amount of travel from China here is a, is a good thing. But I also think we need to be honest with people about the fact that we will always be at risk for this disease coming here because we will never turn off the supply of people and planes and ships altogether coming here from China, given the interconnectedness of our world, interconnectedness of, of vital uh, traffic back and forth. My time has expired. I'd just like to add that um, this has been looked at in a number of circumstances, including the lead up um, prior to the 2009 influenza pandemic. And essentially the best evidence suggests that a lockdown of travel will at most prevent an introduction for perhaps weeks. That is not meaningful in the context of developing a vaccine. A vaccine could take a year or more. It's not like flu where we have an existing platform that we can use to create a new uh, version of a flu vaccine for the use in the pandemic. So I, I don't disagree that slowing is a good idea if it is a meaningful amount of time that can be slowed and if the consequences don't uh, don't aren't worse than than the disease itself. Right. I, I appreciate the point that my colleague from Florida is making. I just want to emphasize one piece that you know we certainly have emphasized to the administration is the best thing we can do right now is get the smartest people, our smartest epidemiologists, and everyone working side by side with Chinese and the global um, community to figure out as much as we can about infectiousness, um, incubation, transmission, et cetera. And again, the best thing we can do is get those folks in, into China. And the president may be working on this every day with phone calls, et cetera. But again, we're here to help. And I, I do think we can then better answer a lot of those questions if we can get our folks into China to, to help answer some of those questions. I'm going to go to the chairman of the, the full committee, Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this important hearing on the coronavirus outbreak. It's one of the reasons why I love this committee. We're really right in the center of things and quickly as well. So I want to start by expressing my sympathy and condolences to everyone who has been impacted by the outbreak, including the people of China, other affected countries, and those here in the United States. It's hard to imagine how painful and scary these past weeks have been for these families. Here on the Foreign Affairs Committee, we know that global health is critical to our national security. We held a hearing on women's health this morning, but the rapid spread of the coronavirus over the past month shows this all too clearly. Our country needs substantial resources to strengthen our ability to prepare for and respond to public health crises like this. But instead of building up that capacity, the Trump administration has scaled down some of our most critical public health institutions. Over the past three years, the administration has slashed the budgets for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, known as CDC, National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, and the CDC's Global Health Security Agenda, making it much harder for the agency to respond to outbreaks overseas. And here in the U.S., our own response capabilities are diminished. State and local health departments, our first line of defense in public health emergencies, are short-staffed, down tens of thousands of health workers compared to where we were in just in 2008. This fiscal year, President Trump is proposing a nearly 20 percent cut to the CDC's budget, and you heard that right. Just as we're confronting the coronavirus, the President wants to cut the very agency on the front lines of fighting the disease. I think Americans from all corners of the nation will find that extremely unwise, if not crazy, and I hope all my colleagues will join me in opposing this dangerous plan and committing to support the CDC's important work. Rather, building up our institutions is critical. So is working hand in hand with other countries and investing in international bodies like the World Health Organization, WHO. In order for us to effectively fight this virus, 
We need to respond with evidence-based practices, transparency, collaboration, and communication. To that end, I'm glad that, that the Chinese authorities have been more cooperative partners with the United States and others in the international community in handling the coronavirus that they were, do, that they were do, during 2003 SARS outbreak. So maybe we learned something from that. But the way the Chinese Communist Party has treated its citizens in response to this outbreak is horrifying. Crackdowns on transparency and information, brave doctors and ordinary citizens facing draconian punishments, merely for speaking about the outbreak, it's unacceptable and must come to an end. And in our own country, we need to approach this outbreak with a scientific, fast-based approach. The United States and other countries around the world have put in place unprecedented travel restrictions in response to the virus. These measures are not proven to improve public health outcomes. Rather, they tend to cause economic harm and to stoke racist and discriminatory responses to this, epi to this epidemic. Now I'll turn to ask questions of our witness, our witnesses. I must note I'm profoundly disappointed that the Trump administration would not agree to send any government officials to testify today. I understand that there was some kind of briefing uh, today, but uh, this hearing was set for a long time, and we didn't get any cooperation from the administration. I've personally asked the administration to send a witness to the hearing. The American people deserve to hear firsthand what the government is doing to protect them in this situation. Nonetheless, I'm pleased that we have such a distinguished panel of experts before us today. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And with that, I'll move to my question. <clears throat> Over the past three years, we've seen reductions in funding for epidemic prevention efforts abroad, attempted cuts to foreign assistance, including G global health security funding, as well as the elimination of the NSC Global Health Security and Bio Threats Directorate. How would you assess our nation's current capacity to address epidemics both here in our own country and in terms of offering our expertise to help other countries around the world? Anyone who would care to, uh, to answer that, I, I'd be happy. Thank you. I would like to uh, point out that um, this is not the only emergency that our scientists at the Centers for Disease Control are managing. They are also still trying to end an Ebola epidemic in the DRC. There are other important uh, transmission of, wild, of polio in the world. Um, th this past year has been a um, unprecedented in terms of measles cases. So I think what this points to is the need for continued support and increased support um, for the CDC and for their, HH, their other health partners. Anybody else? Can I, can I add um, yes. that uh, in the last 17 years, uh, US CDC has been working with China CDC hand in hand in every single pandemic uh, or epidemic in China. Um, and the current difficulty, I feel, it relates to your comments, uh, is the re reduction of collaborations in the last uh, three to, uh, you know, two to three years. The, N the NSF, uh, National Science Foundation office, was closed in Beijing uh, last, in 2018. The GAP program, the Global AIDS program, was closed last year. The NIH and the CDC program all reduced in size uh, in Beijing. So when we talk about the influence, uh, U.S. has a huge influence on Chinese public health a few years ago. But the problem is the interruption in the last few years. Congressman, I just reiterate what I said uh, before you arrived. Uh, the best way to keep the American people safe is to engage globally and to help uh, fight diseases overseas. Uh, President Obama made a big point of creating a, helping to create a CDC in Africa so that we could help fight disease there. Global health security is American security, and we need to continue to support and invest in that. Let me uh, thank you very much. Let me ask one final question. If it was asked and answered, please let me know. And that is, um, how would you rate the response to this epidemic by the Chinese government and by WHO and other UN specialized agencies so far? Um, what has been the impact of Taiwan's exclusion 
from the WHO and other UN specialized agencies, given its proximity to the Chinese mainland, its status as a transit and trade hub, and the handful of cases reported there as well. I study outbreaks and epidemics and pandemics in various different settings. And in every situation that we've looked at, there have always been challenges, there have always been missteps, and there's always been mistakes. I have not personally seen yet mistakes that I haven't also seen in other places. And so while I think that there's an important gap in our knowledge and for which I think it is incredibly urgent that we gain additional data in order to answer some of these questions that we still have. Um, I also have to imagine that any country dealing with tens of thousands, I mean, we're essentially at tens of thousands of cases now, would be hard pressed to handle all that it needs to do, including managing the, the patients, standing up um, enhanced laboratory surveillance, rolling it out to all of the hospital clinics, making sure the hospitals have all the pers personal protective equipment that they need. So I am very um, reluctant to criticize anybody at this point. In terms of the World Health Organization, they are limited by their member states. The international health regulations were established to define the maximum efforts that countries should take in the name of disease control. They are inherently looking at international issues and not what individual countries do within their own borders so long as it doesn't spill across their borders. What we have seen from the WHO is that they have been very reluctant to call out countries, all countries, not just China. And there was questions earlier about um, whether they were unduly influenced by China. Just looking at the Ebola outbreak in the DRC, there was a long period for which many individuals thought that they should have declared a public health emergency of international concern, and they didn't want to. And I believe, and the Director General said, and I believe him at his word, that one of his deep concerns was that in doing so, it would encourage countries to take non-evidence-based actions like banning travel and trade, et cetera very much um, mindful of what happened in Ebola in 2014. This was again reiterated as a concern about declaring a public health emergency of international concern for this current outbreak. And um, what we saw was that uh, countries, even before the declaration, but certainly after the de declaration, did just that. So I believe the WHO is in a very difficult position of one, not having enough resources itself it's still very much on the ground in essentially a war zone in the DRC trying to stop the spread of Ebola, and now also managing this, and many other outbreaks in insecure settings in the world. I want to be conscious of each of the members' times if you have anything to, to add to that, otherwise, great. Thanks. With that, let me um, recognize Ms. Wagner from Missouri. I thank the chair very much, uh, certainly for organizing this timely hearing. I want to thank all, all of our witnesses for being here today. I represent the St. Louis area and, and, and greater metropolitan region, and many, many of my constituents do business, they study, and travel in China. And I appreciate the opportunity to learn more about the rapidly changing coronavirus outbreak um, so I can I can share best practices and uh, up-to-date information with, with uh, other St. Louisans in Missouri's 2nd Congressional District uh, specifically. And I'd like to just say this. I, I, contrary to um, uh, some of the things that are being represented here today, I've had a number of briefings. I've probably attended at least three myself. My staff has had daily briefings and the NIH, CDA, or CDC, um, Health and Human Services, the administration. So I want to applaud the Trump administration for um, an amazing amount of information transparency uh, and trying to keep us uh, up to date uh, on things that are really very frightening, um, I think, globally and certainly here at home. I also would like to thank Representatives Conley and Shabbat for introducing the bipartisan Global Health Security Act to establish a permanent official respons uh, responsible for epidemic and pandemic uh, preparedness. I'm proud uh, to be an original co-sponsor of the bill, and I urge my colleagues to, to support it. 
um, health systems across the developing world lack the capacity to control the spread of the novel coronavirus. Uh, Mr. Klain, uh, how is, and I'll ask the question, then I want to put a, a, a context on it. I want to know how the U.S. is, and this sounds broad, but how is the U.S. helping these partners to prepare? I know for a fact that the CDC and the NIH here in the United States of America have been, were begging in very early January uh, China to come in, help, be there on the ground, um, and it took them three weeks. It wasn't until about the 28th or 29th of, uh, of January before they finally said, oh, please, rush on over. We could use, use the, the, uh, the help and the assistance, and we are there on the ground in a very big presence and way. So what else are we doing to help, um, help these partners prepare? What more needs to be done? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. And I was waiting for either Mr. Connolly or Mr. Chabot to show up here to praise their bill that you're the co-sponsor of. I think H.R. 2166 yes. is vital legislation. I hope this committee and the Congress will act on it. It's bipartisan as well, as it should be. Um, what I'd say is, uh, and this is why I've been a little, perhaps more critical of the Chinese than, uh, than Dr. Nuzzo, I think this delay of a month of getting our people on the ground there right. in China uh, is hard to explain and hard to justify. And I think uh, it's good that we have some people there. We should have more experts there. We have the best experts in the world here working for our government. Uh, having them uh, on the ground, I think, would be a, a And we were trying and for we're tr over and a month to get, yeah, yeah, to get yes, there. I, and we will come up with the cure and the vaccine. Now, sadly, it will take months and months to probably uh, do that. But Yes, ma'am. The other thing I'd say is we, uh, we also need to be working with the nations around China, right? We, we're going to see spread of this virus certainly through the region, probably globally, but certainly first and foremost the region. Other nations in the neighborhood have less advanced healthcare systems than China, less resources, less ability to, to manage this than even the Chinese do. So we ought to be reaching out to them to see what we can do to help them. They may need more direct assistance from us in terms of the response. And of course, we need to be beefing up our own preparedness for cases here. Well, I think we are doing that. I think we're very much on top of that. That's certainly what the briefings have been, been, been telling, telling me. Dr. Nuzzo, what challenges does the U.S. face in deploying testing services? Thank you. I'm, that's an area that I'm particularly concerned about. There um, seems to be a testing lag right now for mm -hmm. um, individuals here in the United States. That's in part because the CDC has been doing all of the testing, and I know that they plan to roll um, test uh, kits out to the state laboratories, which I think will be essentially important. Um, and it's essential that um, states think about how they're going to be doing the testing and what the plan is for that. But it, we don't just need it at public health labs. We also need it at hospitals and health clinics so that doctors can use it to guide treatment well, and isolate patients. And, and in addition, given that respirators and other medical equipment are largely produced and shipped from China, um, how can we best address supply chain issues? I keep hearing this over and over again, supply chain issues that could become critical if the coronavirus were to spread more widely in the in the U.S., I mean, I I, I talked about some of the of the medical equipment and respirators that that are mainly sourced in in and produced in, in China, but it, it, it's also masks. It's it's, it's so many things. So, uh, can you speak to that, please? Yeah. So we need to be assessing the medical supply chain and see where there are potential vulnerabilities. That is, I know, work that's been ongoing, and I've been encouraged to hear that the agencies have been working on that. But it's also needs to be addressed at the political strategy level in China because the decisions that they are making internally could impact that beyond just our own assessment of what countries produce things where and can we get it from somewhere else. Um, this summer, the U.S. experienced critical shortages in the drug heparin, which is a blood thinner. Right. This shortage was in part due to China's efforts to control the spread of African swine fever, which is not a human disease, it's a pig disease. They were culling pigs. We need the pigs to make the heparin. So we have already seen the impact of how decisions made in the name of controlling a disease can affect health and health care here in the U.S. I have uh, a lot of other questions. I'll go ahead and submit them. I appreciate the chair's indulgence, and I will yield back. Thank you all for being Great. here. Great. Thank you. And I appreciate um, my colleagues. And, and again, a compliment to the administration that the briefings that they have been giving us, their experts, et cetera, um, on a regular basis, as to our, well as to our staff. That said, um, We'd love for those experts to come before a committee in a public setting to answer those questions. And what we're really asking for is 
How can we be of assistance? You know, what do they need from Congress in terms of appropriations, et cetera? And again, these experts ought to be talking to the public and not just members of Congress. With that, let me recognize Ms. Spanberger from Virginia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And to our witnesses today, thank you very much for what has been a very interesting conversation focused on uh, the epidemiology of this disease and how it's spreading and also a policy uh, discussion related to what we can do as members of Congress. Uh, Mr. Klein, I'd, I'd also like to thank you for your very specific seven-point plan and recommendations of things that we should see at a, from a federal perspective um, out of Washington to help with this and, and future um, future viruses and future outbreaks. Um, and you have talked about the need for high-level diplomacy to address threats on the ground. And so I'd like to briefly just talk about that from this committee's perspective, looking long-term. Uh, I've I have deep concerns about the fact that we have uh, vacancies at State Department um, and other agencies. We have individuals who continue to work in acting positions not um, fully confirmed. And reflecting back on your experiences working with other outbreaks, looking forward towards what we're dealing with now, could you just tell me briefly what your day-to-day uh, -day experiences were, how much you were interacting with diplomats and with civil servants, and how some of these staffing challenges might be impacting our ability to react currently? Yeah, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, my job in coordinating the Ebola response was really to oversee the all-of-government response that President Obama summoned, and that means daily interactions with key people at the agencies at all levels, uh, some at the cabinet level, some below that. I think the good news is many really high quality people remain in key posts. Tony Fauci is a national icon and hero. Uh, Dr. Shukat at CDC, others throughout the government. We have great people, Ambassador Green at, at USAID, for example. But I do worry about some of the gaps, particularly at DHS. You know, Congressman Perry was saying, how could you possibly screen all these people coming here and so on and so forth? That's a DH DHS function. It will require great skill and organization to do that. I worry about the vacancies there. I worry about the loss of institutional capacity at the highest levels of the State Department, which has to manage so much of the logistics of an international response. So there are gaps. that We have some great people in our government. We have some gaps in our government. And uh, we're going to need to manage all that. And lastly, as I said, I think someone at the White House really needs to be running this every day to help fill those gaps, but also to be interacting with other countries. I had uh, daily calls with people in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, weekly calls with my counterparts in the UK and France. These are high-level interactions that really are needed to uh, make a global response like this effective. Thank you very much. And Dr. Nuzzo, as we're looking at uh, contagious outbreaks, um, and in this case, here's a contagious outbreak. It's happening on the other side of the world, and all of us represent districts here um, in the United States. My question for you is, how could or how should the federal government work in ensuring that medical providers across the United States uh, can deal with some of the concerns, have the information they need, have the resources that they need, um, and that's one part of it. And then the other part of it would be, how can we um, help as members of Congress to ensure that the information is getting out there and that these uh, physicians and hospitals have what they need? And, and do you anticipate that there are specific resources that will need to be mobilized to support clinicians across the country if we do see increased spread here at home? Yes, thank you. I had said earlier that um, although that we have a perception that this is an epidemic that's happening across the world, we actually don't have enough information to say for sure where it's happening. Um, we're only testing uh, around people's uh, connection to China. Does that mean that, are you asserting that it could be elsewhere and we're yes. not yet attuned to that? Yes. Okay, thank you. And, and that's what other countries are doing as well. I mean, it, it could very well already be here. And I think an important thing for us to all consider in thinking about this is it's not just about how many cases we have in the world, but our level of concern should be tiered to what our perception of the severity is. And I continue to be encouraged by the fact that we are seeing many, many more mild cases than we initially thought were possible, particularly outside of China. As I said earlier, we need to understand what's going on in China about those severe cases and deaths to know if they are in the people that we would expect to have severe illness and death regardless of what pathogen, what respiratory virus they have. It seems like from the, some of the death reports is that's the case, the elderly and people with underlying medical conditions. Mm -hmm. And if you walked into any hospital in the United States and just looked for people suffering from respiratory viruses, you would see um, disturbing things. 
Um, I think a critical thing that we need here in the United States is enhanced diagnostic capabilities. We are moving test kits to the state labs, which will be important for supplementing our understanding of the virus and where it is, and potentially to think about expanding the categories of people that we test. But we also need this in healthcare clinics so that they don't have to wait a day or more to get a test result for a patient to make a decision about whether or not to isolate somebody, how they should treat them, et cetera. And although we've heard if a I, lot of attention on medicines and, and um, vaccines, there's less attention to um, diagnostics. And so I think that's where a, a funding um, opportunity as well as um, funding for state health departments and hospitals who are going to be on the front lines of this. And, and just a follow-up point quickly on that. So in the absence of those diagnostic tools in clinics and in, with health providers across the country, the alternative then is what? The alternative is you don't get tested for coronavirus. I mean, we are only at this point testing absent the people who are traveling, but in the United States, you have to have a, a lower respiratory infection and have traveled to Wuhan specifically. Mm -hmm. Or if you have traveled to China, broader China, you have to be hospitalized for your infection. So we are only looking at a very small number of people. And so to your earlier point about um, people's level of concern, et cetera, I think having diagnostic tools to help know what people's illnesses are um, will be useful. And in the absence of that testing from your perspective and your role, how does that uh, contribute to the spread of disease at a faster, slower? It absolutely contributes to the spread of disease because we don't know where it is. We don't know who to stop okay. from coming, and we don't know who to isolate. Um, I, but I am continued to be encouraged by the appearance of mild symptoms because it's important to recognize that we live with a whole lot of respiratory viruses that mm -hmm. don't have, we don't have hearings about. Excellent. Thank you. I've gone well over time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Bowie, no, you need to finish that conversation. If I could, I, I would, because I, I just Dr. Nazo mentioned several times that the cases outside China are milder. Uh, I, you know, no one, I agree with uh, her question, but some uh, hypothesis or, or, you know, uh, potential answers are in China, especially in Wuhan, within China, there are different, uh, we see different uh, percentage of fatality. Uh, Wuhan is the highest. So I wonder if uh, Wuhan, uh, they, the, they, they only hospitalize hospital the most uh, people who has the most uh, symptoms. So there's a, it's a reflection of a lack of uh, resources medically. Did you, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bamberger, you got that? Okay, thank you. Well, now I'd like to ask you something. And in your remarks, you said that in 2003, the industries hurt most by SARS were tourism, retail, and entertainment. And at that point, those industries made up 43% of China's GDP. They now account for 54%. And China contributes a much larger share to the world's economy. I serve as the co-chair of the Travel and Tourism Caucus, and I recognize the huge impact of tourism on local economies. Also, China has expressed concern about travel restrictions that have been announced by the White House and noted correctly that the World Health Organization advises against the application of restrictions of international traffic based on the information that's currently available. Could you address how we might uh, balance U.S. security precautions with the negative impacts that these restrictions on travel could have on travel and tourism here in the U.S. and on international commercial activities? And then either one of you could also weigh in. Sure, if I can say uh, quickly that I think both quarantines and uh, travel bans, all of these uh, social distancing uh, measures uh, can harm the economy. So it's always a, uh, so often I tell people I'm a public health researcher, a public health worker, then I, I'm all for social distancing. But usually it's not just me talking, it's the economy is also talking. So uh, as you mentioned that in my report, I provided some statistics. 
that um, it's going to harm uh, China's GDP. Uh, and, and how how much? Uh, it depends how long the quarantine will be on, how how long the travel uh, travel ban will be on. So I urge uh, all the policymakers to to think about these uh, measures as a temporary measures, and uh, certainly balance uh, the uh, the economic loss versus health care concerns. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clark. Congressman, I just add. Um, we live in a global economy, an uh, interconnected economy. It is impossible, impossible, to cut off the flow of people from China to the United States. They're needed to bring vital goods to the United States by boat and by plane. We have Americans coming back to and from, back from China, family members, so on and so forth. So my, my point about travel bans is, is beyond the effectiveness issues that Dr. Nuzo has raised, as a practical matter, we don't have one, we will never have one. And therefore, what we need to do is to monitor the people who've been in China recently, who are here in the US, and impose public health measures on a, ma on a very large scale. This is a hump complicated, it's a hard problem to uh, detect if those people get sick, to isolate them, and to treat them. That's the, that, this isn't about academics, it's the only practical solution on the facts we face here. Dr. Nuzzo. I was just reacting to the, the, the notion of monitoring, and I um, agree that it's a preferable um, approach mm -hmm. than the restriction of travel and the quarantines. Um, I am less optimistic about the impact of those measures and just reflecting on Ebola that we monitored 30,000 individuals and found not a single case of Ebola, and yet those um, programs that were essentially necessarily stood up overnight um, in many respects, d diverted resources from, I think, more important work. So I, I used to be a public health practitioner, so I'm thinking from the, the, the field mm -hmm. and what it means for them. Um, you know, these measures are only as effective as people believe in their utility. Uh, there was an important paper where a bunch of um, clinicians were monitored for their symptoms for Ebola and upon returning, and um, a large a surprisingly large percentage of them reported that they lied about their temperatures because they didn't believe that they should be monitored. So n nothing is perfect, um, and if that's where we need to go, I, I truthfully, from an epidemiological perspective, think that those approaches are m more about politics than, than public health. But um, if that is what is needed to be done to provide assurances and to make people feel better, um, then I, in my view, it's potentially less resource intensive than some of um, what I've also heard proposed. Well, not only does uh, travel ban or uh, restrictions or monitoring impact the economy, doesn't it also make it more difficult to share information so that we can address the outbreak breaks quickly or get international cooperation from others addressing the problem? So I'm deeply concerned about penalizing countries that report cases. And when you implement travel bans or trade restrictions, that is a penalty. Um, China may be able to handle it, but other countries around the world are watching who haven't yet reported any cases. And I can imagine they're seeing what's playing out and thinking, is it in their best interest to tell, to even look for cases, first of all? So that's something that I'm particularly concerned about. I also agree with all the statements that have been made about the importance of gaining access to data in China. I particularly think uh, trying to understand the severity is a, is a um, matter of priority and I don't truthfully understand what the rate limiting step is. I'm not, con I'm not sure that, it's, that they don't have the right epidemiologists or scientists. I think China is actually quite capable. The fact that they have pumped out many Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine papers does not to signal to me a lack of expertise. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a paper next week that tells us more than we already know. Um, but I think that this is critically important and we should do everything in our power to make sure we continue to incentivize the flow of information. So it affect, negatively affects the economy, and travel and tourism, negatively affects our ability to get information, negatively affects our ability to cooperate with other countries. And finally, we have in the past sent healthcare workers to other countries where these outbreaks occur like Ebola. But now with this new approach of bringing people home, that cuts off that uh, assistance as well, doesn't it? 
And just to add to that, um, what happened in Ebola, even the threats of quarantines for healthcare workers actually uh, put a chilling effect on the number of doctors and nurses who were willing to go volunteer, essentially put their lives on the line to fight a deadly virus. Um, just the prospect of coming back and having to, in addition to the time away from their families and their jobs, then be put into quarantine. Um, that's another concern that I have. If, if I could just could very quickly, I think it's important that public health and scientific analysis drive these decisions, not politics. So the same day that we quarantined a charter plane of Americans coming from Wuhan, that same day, planes landed at airports all over this country, bringing people from China to airports all over this country, okay? And so, it's, it's, you know, I just think that these, these policies about travel restrictions and quarantines, which I understand why they're politically compelling, I understand why uh, one of the members earlier said it kind of like passes the common sense test, but policies that are kind of filled with Swiss cheese and exceptions and, and unevenly applied don't keep us safe and raise the kinds of concerns about cooperation and effectiveness that Dr. Nuzo raised. So whatever we do, I think we need to be candid about what we're doing and what we're not doing and let science drive those decisions. Okay. Great, let, let me take the chair's liberty here um, and give each of the witnesses a, a minute or two. If there was anything we didn't ask that we should have been asking or thinking about or that would be in the public's interest of, of asking, maybe we'll start with you, Mr. Klain, um, if, again, a minute or two just. Uh, yeah, just, what I would say just very briefly is Congressman Sherman said uh, before we left that we have a tendency to overreact to these things. And what I'd say is it's actually more complicated than that. We have a tendency to overreact in the short term and then underreact in the long term. Uh, in, after the 2001 anthrax attacks, this body appropriated billions of dollars to prepare for a potential pandemic. And most of those investments were frittered away because they weren't followed up. Most of that was gone when I took over the Ebola response in 2014. This body then put billions of dollars into responding to Ebola very effectively. And yet before the coronavirus outbreak, we were, we were set to see the national hospital network that protects us from these infectious diseases expire in May without being renewed. So what I would say is we should address this crisis or this challenge immediately, but also make the consistent long-term investments in pandemic preparedness and response that are vital to keep this nation safe over the long run. Again, I think the Connolly Shabbat bill is a good start on that. There are many other proposals, but I think it's, it's consistent focus that really keeps this country safe. Great. Dr. Bowie, if there's anything that we left out or we should have asked. Um, I will focus, uh, I will emphasize that uh, it is a battle between human and the virus. It's not between person to person, and it's not between party to party, it's not between country to country. I really hope that uh, global health should be a area uh, for research, for healthcare, uh, collaborations that's beyond uh, all the conflicts. I think it needs a long-term investment not only in the infrastructure, but also in collaboration, in capacity building. And I hope no matter what happens between the two countries, between the two, two parties, that this area can be protected because this is critical for uh, all, every country, for all the human beings. So this should be more than uh, just pointing fingers, but it, this is a time for collaboration. Thank you, Dr. B. Dr. Niza. As I mentioned in my remarks, I'm increasingly of the belief that this virus um, is not something that we can stop at borders, that we cannot contain it, that we should um, be probably shifting our focus to one more of trying to mitigate its spread and, and mitigate the impacts. And as I look at the situation, it's of course evolving and complex, but it's increasing to me, increasingly to me looking like what we saw in 2009 with the influenza pandemic. And we have a number of things that we've learned during 2009. So we learned that the travel restrictions and the quarantines didn't stop the spread. Within months, the virus was everywhere. And that's because we had more capabilities to do surveillance for flu than we have for novel coronavirus right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if we had those capabilities if we saw a very similar map um, to what we saw in 2009. So I really think we should be thinking about in the context of that and, and asking if this were flu, would we be doing these things? Um, obviously, there are still questions about severity, but increasingly, and my 
my perspective is that we will find more cases and our perception of severity will decline. The other thing I want to point out is that I actually see some optimism here. Just looking at what we have learned in the amount of time that we've learned from countries who have previously had difficulties, like for instance South Korea. In 2015, it had a very bad MERS uh, outbreak that caught it off guard, that they really struggled with, and their information and their um, ability to do surveillance and an epi investigation of the case, the, the novel coronavirus cases, to me is the symbol of what our goals are when we make investments and we work with countries to improve their capacities. And we are the direct benefits of that. So I just want to stress that it is we, we need more information from other countries. The fact that they are able to get this information is likely because of our help and assistance in many places. We should continue those efforts, not just, as I mentioned, in China, but in other countries that we expect to struggle. And um, I think that we should continue to assess our plans based on the information that we have coming in. And crucially, in my mind, not so much the number of cases, but the severity. Great. Thank you. Let me allow the ranking member to make a closing statement, and I'll make one myself. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. And uh, Mr. Klain, I've got this article here, and you're saying we need to keep politics out of it. It needs to be factual based. Uh, but just the, the, the title of this, Corona is, Coronavirus is Coming and Trump Isn't Ready. And I read it, and uh, there's a lot of politics in that article. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Dr. Nuzo and Dr. Bowie, you're both epidemiologists. Um, we know that uh, the epicenter is supposedly the Wuhan area, the fish market and um, um, the wet market, correct? Do you feel it was sufficiently studied to get the, uh, the possible um, uh, original outbreak of where it came from? Do you feel that? Do you have any indication? No. Um, one of the concerns. You said no. You don't think it was. No, I don't think it was sufficiently studied. Okay. And, and I know that um, I've I've heard not just um, WHO, but also some of the major philanthropies are putting money towards enhancing the study of that. Trying. But yet the Chinese government destroyed it completely. The way I understand it, is that correct? I don't. I don't have information about that. Dr. Bowie, do you know? Um, I know they, after they announced the outbreak, they closed the, uh, that um, animal, um, the wet market the next day. They thought it was the, the resources. We don't know. We don't know whether it's, uh, there's a person working there has the first case and transmitted to other people or the, the animal source was there. We don't know that. But that's supposedly was where it was reported, where it came from, but then we've heard it was completely um, demolished and destroyed. Um, and that, there again, that creates a cloud of confusion. You know, what is their intent? And if we're going to work on this collaboratively together between countries, politics needs to go away and it needs to be based on science because this is something that we're all in threat of. And I think you brought up over and over again how it doesn't seem to be as virulent in other countries, and let's hope it, it maintains that way. Um, but I worry about countries like Africa, where there's a large Chinese population uh, in the Belt Road Initiative, and their inability to check with uh, diagnostic equipment. So this is something that's going to be fluid. We're going to watch, and I, we want to make sure. I think it's to everyone's advantage, advantage to know where it comes from. Right. Right. So I don't think it's... Americans or Chinese, it's everyone wants to know that. Sure. Yep. We're all here together. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Great. Thank you. And just in, in close, um, first off, I want to thank each of you for taking the time to, to come here, as well as your service to both science as well as to our, to our country and the global community. Um, you know, again, the message to the administration here is we're here to work as Congress. We're all on the same page here. And to the global community, and, and to the Chinese, you know, let's get ahead of this, and it'll take all of our resources to learn as much as we can. You know, I think I can't speak for the CDC, but in my conversations with the CDC, with Dr. Fauci and others, we want to get there and work with you side by side. And if there's one thing that we can do, it's that. Second thing is really put someone in control of this. Um, this isn't the last time we're going to see a pandemic. This isn't the, the last time we're going to be dealing with um, a, a viral outbreak. Um, and as we get ahead of this, let's not lose sight. sight. Mr. Klain, you talked about this, is let's stop just responding to 
crisis after crisis. Let's actually make this part of our national security agenda. And you know, I had the privilege of being a commission member for CSIS. They just came out with a recommendation on what we could be doing with, uh, with regards to global health security. And you know, in a bipartisan way, it was a great commission, great members of Congress on there, but also um, you know, working closely with the administration and others to come up with um, recommendations. And, and I would say, let's deal with the, the situation that we have in front of us right now, but then let's take some of those recommendations and act on them. So, you know, again, I thank the witnesses and all the members for being here today. And with that, the committee is adjourned.